experience. And I, I want to um, I want to introduce this with a, with a little bit of a thought. If you look with me in First Corinthians, sacred place there is John chapter fifteen. Look with me to First Corinthians chapter thirteen. I want to read a verse, and then we'll look at First Thessalonians, and I'll read a verse. We'll talk about them for just a little bit, and then come back to John chapter fifteen. First Corinthians chapter thirteen, of course, has been dubbed the love chapter. Uh, that word charity, it's a wonderful word. Now I'm looking for the last verse, chapter 13 and verse 13. I'm going to draw a connection between three things. It says in verse 13 of, John, of 1 Corinthians 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. But again, I want you to see that, that God in this verse has connected three thoughts, faith, hope, and charity. And now over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and, and you may remember a message I preached some time back on, on this chapter. But this verse, as a matter of fact, this was the time frame that I went to Alabama and I, I preached a message connected to verse number 3. I can't remember everything that I said here or there, but... But I, I, I know I said some of these things somewhere. So if, if you remember it, praise the Lord. If not, I guess praise the Lord too. But, but three things it mentions here in verse number three. It says, remembering without ceasing your three things, your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Now it gives us uh, a work that is of faith, a labor that is of love, and a patience that is of hope. Have you ever considered, I, I know I preached it one time, but have you ever considered uh, those thoughts? The work that's of faith, the work, and he's talking to a church, if you recall, 1 Thessalonians, written to the church in Thessalonica, and it's a church that is beloved of the Apostle Paul. It's, endear, it's dear to his heart, much like Philippi, and he is, he is, uh, he is speaking to them. Uh, it, it's implied in the book that, that maybe they are without a pastor at this time, without leadership, but, but faithful uh, people of the church have risen to provide leadership until such time they get a pastor. That seems to be the way it is. doesn't tell us that. But he's speaking to them much like a pastor giving direction. <coughs> And he talks to this church about these three things. And through the rest of the book, you'll see those three things mentioned and even discussed or even outlined. But it says, a work of faith. And then it goes through the rest of this chapter after this verse talking about their work of faith. We talked about soul winning a while ago. These people had gone soul winning and had gone out and won so many people to the Lord. In their whole area, Paul says... There's no need for me to even talk to people about the gospel. You have already covered the area. The Apostle Paul said that. Have you ever noticed that? He says, uh, he reads, that, reads all the way through the end of the chapter. He says in verse number 5, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, also in power and in the Holy Ghost, in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Ye you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, far from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. Amen. This was a church doing a work of faith. Amen. Hey, listen. The difference in just working and doing a work of faith is a work of faith is something that Christ has told us to do and given us the charge and the ability we talked about in our Sunday school class enabled by the Holy Ghost to do these things. And by faith, we step out and just do it. Amen? Amen? Yes. Work of faith. It's a mighty work. The reason it's a mighty work is because God is in it. It need not be staffed with all the best. You know, the pros, the Bible... We are talking about Bible college earlier. Nothing wrong with Bible college folk. 
But I'm just telling you, we don't have to get a bunch of those to run a good bus. We don't have to get a bunch of those to have an effective Sunday school. We don't have to get a bunch of professionals in here in order to reach our city for Christ. Amen. We have been given a work to do by faith. A work of faith. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. So a work of faith. And then... Followed by a work of faith, it says, a labor of love. Now the work is the that which we've been called to, to do, to step forth. If, if the Lord were to, to call us to, well, I tell you, I believe the Lord's laid on, my, laid on my heart, and I hope He's laying it on your heart, that we might start ten churches in Orlando. Amen. Don't get scared on me. We can do this. We can do this. Hey, I just believe one thing at a time. Follow God by faith. He will give us the land. Amen. I, I want that mountain. Lord, give me that mountain. I believe He will give it to us. Do you believe that? Amen. Believe it? Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, uh, I got that from the Lord. I'm just saying, I got that praying and asking the Lord where we should go as a church. Ten churches in Orlando. It might take us a couple of years to get that done. Yeah? We need to grow a little bit because we need to send some families out. We can't send all of our families out. We we'll still have some here when we do it. So we have to do some growing. So it will take some soul winning. So it will take some a lot of stuff. But I believe God is in it. I believe it from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. God can reach the city of Okoe, Orlando for the Lord Jesus Christ. By faith. By faith. The labor of love is, is, um, is not the same as the work of faith. The labor of love is the, the labor, the intense, ongoing, maybe even mundane Week by week, day by day, work of doing and that needs to be done to get the work of faith done. It's the, it's the Sunday school teacher, yes, bless my heart, get up and spend 15 minutes a day preparing my lesson and getting an hour and a half a week and then getting up early on Sunday and being ready. Amen. I do those funny things. I'm hoping to get you to say amen. Hey, listen, I love, I love serving the Lord. But it takes work. Yes, sir. It takes work. It is labor intensive. Mm -hmm. Labor intensive. So the labor of love is that work that goes into the work of faith. Now it's the ongoing work. Have you ever um, has anyone ever challenged you? Well, I have challenged you to go so many. I, I guess um I guess I should say, do you remember me challenging you to go so late? Uh, I have been challenged by preachers in my day. Yes? To go so late. Go so late. Um, I can remember a day, I can remember a preacher saying, uh, you just need to, by the way, I do love the most precious things. I'm going to tell you, I get out there and I'm knocking on doors. And, and anybody that goes with me can take, when I leave the door where they can check the gospel, all I can talk about to the next door is the burden that creates in my heart for that person. But love for that person will not keep you doing the work. As much as I would like to say, if you have a love for the people, uh, the, the people in your Sunday school class, you will keep doing your Sunday school class. If you have a love for Orlando, you'll go out and start a church in Orlando. If you have a love for the people in your ministry, or if you have a love for lost precious souls, you'll knock on the next door. Beloved, it's not about loving the people. You need to have a love for God. Amen. He's the one that loves the people. If you love Him, He'll take you to the next door. That's right, man. I, I, I got so discouraged. Man, I'll tell you, I was saved. In 1987, and a year later, within a year, I was running from Jesus in the call to preach. 
And then I ran from the Lord for two years. And I, I forget how the, the year, the timing all works out, but I found myself in Bible college. I was telling someone about that in Texas. I was writing this sort of that occasionally they'll put in free how to lead somebody to Christ things, you know. I, I got every one of those, seven points and five points. <laughs> I took every advice I could get. I had led, by the time I, from 19, was it 19, 1990 to 91 or so, I led 2,000 people to the Lord. Man, I was just doing it. I was excited. But one day, my love for those people were just kind of wearing thin. Some of them weren't friendly to me, to be honest with you. I mean, I mean, you knock on the door in East Dallas and they cuss at you. Well, actually, they do that now, right? <laughs> I mean, it's going to have to go to East Dallas to get that these days. What I'm telling you is, it's a labor of love. A love for Jesus. If you're not doing it because you love Jesus, you will not be in it for long. If you're not doing it because you love the Lord, you won't stick. So, well, brother, I, I got love for the people. I, I love them. The day will come when you need something more powerful than that because we get distracted. We get pulled away. We get, we get worn down in the work. It says labor of hope. It says patience that is of hope. Patience is the enduring of tribulation while waiting on God and doing what He's called you to do. Patience. It's a patience of hope. Those three things go together. The work of faith cannot be done without a labor of love. Listen to this. The labor of love will run out on you if you don't have a patience that is of hope. You need them all. You need them all. I, I was meditating on these thoughts. I was trying to decide what to talk about earlier in the week. And the Lord has just uh, drawn me to, to this business of, of the love that we need. John chapter 15. John 15. Wait, so we'll go 14 and 15. Be ready to go back and forth on the page. This is, this is that night before the crucifixion. How rich are the treasures that Jesus spoke that night. He was, he was giving the disciples, the apostles, uh, the how-to maybe, the what-for, summing it up, giving them direction for the future, how to carry out what He's called them to do. And I want to talk to you about this thing called love. Let me ask you a question. And, and I think this is, I think the answer to this is key to a lot of things. A lot of things. Do you love God? You ever think about that? Do you love God? You remember the great commandment? I built a conference on it. We do it every January. We do it to love God conference, right? And and do you remember, uh, you remember the great commandment? Love the Lord thy God. All my heart, all my soul, all my mind. And one place it says, all my strength. Love the Lord. Have you ever noticed, there are several things to notice about loving, what the Bible says about loving God. Have you ever noticed that you don't see that great commandment? I mean, we, after the, uh, the whole transition, uh, you know in the Gospels that uh, Jesus is with us. The Holy Spirit has not yet come on the day of Pentecost. And, and there's going to be a transition. And the way things are change. Yes, you're following me on that. Uh, when the day of Pentecost comes, uh, things will change. And, and Jesus, in the passage we're in, He's given instructions many, in many ways on how to handle things when the change comes. So we can apply a lot of it. It's... Uh, it's interesting to me that you never see the great commandment demonstrated as the great commandment 
Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. You never see that after the Holy Spirit comes. Have you ever noticed that? After we get into the church times, you don't see that commandment. Have you ever thought about that? Why did we quit seeing it? It's, it's big. It is huge all the way up until then. Why do we quit seeing it appear in Scripture in the New Testament? It's not because it went away. It didn't go away. Somebody said the other night that uh, whether it says in the Old Testament or New Testament, think about this, God never changes. Right? He still wants us to love Him. And that didn't change. It didn't go away. But have you ever noticed that the second commandment, you remember what that is? Love thy neighbor as thyself. The second commandment continues to appear. As a matter of fact, it tells us twice in Romans 13, it tells us twice that loving the other is, fulfills the law. All of a sudden we don't need the great commandment, just the second commandment to fulfill the law. And then in James chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible calls love, the, love thy neighbor as thyself the royal commandment. You ever notice that? Why would it be that way? Hey, listen. If you're saved tonight, there are certain things that I know. One is that you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Yes. yes. God's inside of you. Here's something for you. You cannot love God and not love other believers. Can't do it. You cannot love believers and not love God. Those two things go together. It is the royal commandment because now to have a genuine love for you, to have a genuine love for the brethren, and even when it says love thy neighbor in the New Testament, think this would go through and study. I challenge you to find where it means we say your neighbor is anybody, but show me the place that it doesn't mean the brethren. Hey, listen. When you love the brethren, you love God. You can, if you say, I love you, but you tell me you don't love God, you're lying. I'm going to live through that one. <laughs> it's true. If, you, if, you don't, if you're not loving God, you're not loving me. If you're not loving me, beloved, you're not loving God. It's the same way no matter who you put in there. If you're loving saved people, you're loving Jesus. You don't get one without the other. That brings a lot of perspective to the table. It really does. The royal law, love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, I know how I love myself. As a matter of fact, Ephesians tells me that I cherish my flesh. I, I love myself and you love yourself. We have a special esteem for ourselves. But if I'm going to fulfill the law, I have to love you and you and you and you the same way I love me. And that has to be a godly love because God is in all of us and I can't love you without loving Him. Amen. Hey, listen to this. You can't have some perverse sort of love and it be real with another believer. It can't be, it can't be something that's defiled and it be love because God is in the mix. Those things go together. Do you see? Do you love God? Do you love Him? I, uh, I inherited a married couples class. I bought a book. It's, some Protestant made it. And it's, uh, it says five love languages. You ever, you ever hear that? A number of you have. It looks pretty good. I've skimmed through it. I'm probably going to read through it. Sooner or later I may teach from it. Or not from it. But 
honestly, what I'm finding seems like all these principles are in the Bible. If you're just looking for it in the Bible, it might be better. There are five love languages. Did you know that according to this author, if, if I want to demonstrate my love for you, I need to work it. I mean, I need to try. Right? Listen to what he says. There are five things. I guess not everyone has the same, according to him, love language. Yes? Are you following what I'm saying? Not everyone has the same. There are five. And, and you may have one, two, or three, or maybe all five, right, that, that work for you. Listen to this. This, this communicates love to some people. It says words of affirmation. That's a pretty dress. Ladies, would you love for your husband to say that's a pretty dress? <laughs> hey, I, I know, don't want to say quiet. <laughs> get you to say anything. My uh, words of affirmation are powerful. They're powerful. For some people, it's the way to say I love you in a powerful way. Are you following what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, I'll just tell you, I didn't know about the things that were in this book. But for many years, I have a, I've taken this position because of what the Bible says. Words of affirmation. Uh, if I'm talking to someone other than my wife, I don't give words of affirmation unless the husband is there and I can say it through him. Because if somebody says I love you to her in an intimate way, I want it to be him. You don't get words of affirmation from me unless we take that angle. And if it's a single woman, I'll say it through my wife and let her say it. I don't want to affect, effectively communicate some sort of intimacy with some other woman besides my wife. That's right. I think it's sin. Well, I learned that that's one of the love languages. I, by the way, I don't want some other guy uh, doing that with my wife either. Amen. 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 Then uh, quality time, spending quality time. Baby, I, I want you to know I, I blocked out this. I was going to watch the game, but it's all yours. What are we going to do? Hmm. I'm glad she's not in here to hear all of this. <laughs> <laughs> It's a love language. It's a love language. It's a way, uh, there are some people, it's men and women, he says, that respond to different ones of these five. Mm -hmm. This quality time, I, I, think, um, I think for me, I, I want quality time with my wife, but she's about the only one I do. It's because I love her, but I didn't know it was one of these. Then it says receiving gifts. Some people respond to that well. My wife, one year for Christmas, I was so excited. We were not married long, and we did not have a skillet or a, a grill. Man, I say, I say, for Christmas, I mean, it was a big box. It was heavy. The perfect gift, right? And she wasn't excited at all about getting a griddle, an electric skillet for Christmas. I mean, I got... <laughs> all the ladies get in the mirror and say, why not? <laughs> why won't she not find good about that? <laughs> Bunchers don't gifts. work very well either. <laughs> Acts of service. Doing sweet things for your loved one. It's a love language. It says physical touch. Physical touch. All of these things, different ones, communicate that I love you. Now, in the beginning of our marriage, uh, we established, right? You ever hear the guy say, I told her once the day we got married, if she needs to know anything else, I'll tell her, right? Or, or if it ever changes, I'll tell her, or something like that. So he never says, I love you along the way. Well, we established that we love each other years ago. We say, I love you. All right? So we do that. That's established. But these five love languages enable me to 
create an atmosphere that says, I love you, and it creates a happy home. Are you following? It says, I love you. God created us in His what? image. It goes to reason that, that there are things that communicate our love to God. John, uh, look with me in 14. John 14. And the Bible says, verse number 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Is he saying, if, is, what's he saying? If you love me, keep my commandments. So he has commandments for me. And he's, this is instruction for when they get on the other side and begin to, to be the great apostles. But he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's a, what seems to be a love language for God. If I want him to know, how can I know? How can he know if I keep his commandments? It goes on, it says again, and says it in maybe, is it verse 20, 21? 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Well, I, I love God. God says, okay, I know you love me, but if you're going to show me you love me, he says, keep my commandments. Yes, isn't that what he's saying? He goes on in that verse and says, He that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Now Judas, not as scary, and another one, he's not, he's not getting it. He's not understanding it. And he asks the question in verse 22, Lord, how is it that thou wilt thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. So it's not just the commands now. It's the words. The, the implications. What does he say he expects of me? What is revealed about, about him through his words? He says, If, if he love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him well now that's a phrase to consider my father will love him wait we know from john chapter 3 that the father already loves us doesn't he mm -hmm. he already loves us that's established the bible says for god so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He demonstrated His love toward us. Right? So His love is already established. But here it says, if, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. If I communicate my love to God, He's saying He will communicate. There's only two ways to take those words. He will communicate His love to me. You follow? If, excuse me, if I love Him and show Him I love Him, well, He loves me, then He will communicate it to me too. Establish the love, you see? He that loveth, oh, sorry, it says, it says, we will come unto Him, make our abode with Him. He that loveth me not. Now he's talking to believers or unbelievers in the upper room? Believers. Believers. It's not unsaved people he's talking to. He says, he that loveth me not. Is it possible for a believer to not love God? He says, if a man, if he that loveth me not. Keepeth not my sayings. If he says that, I don't think with God in our heart that we cannot love him. I think it is that we can we can not want it and not communicate it. Are you following that? We can resist the love of God. 
He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. The word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Man, those are tough words. Those are tough words. You remember a day, any day, any day, that you'd be guilty of not loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Have you had a day like that? I think that's what he's talking about when he says you don't love me. Uh, because uh, there are folks in the Old Testament that seem to have an affection for God, but God saw through it. They didn't love him with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Following this? One, two. <laughs> Maybe I should back up a little bit. In chapter 15, if you notice the way he begins, he, begins, he illustrates the relationship that believers have with God, with the, the, this, this uh, symbol of the vine. In other words, Christ is the vine. He says, I am the true vine. My father's a husband. And he, he demonstrates this relationship like this. And he goes through and he explains. He really says, I mean, boy, there's a, a lot to say there and, and more than I can say in just a few minutes. But he talks about, he talks about abiding in the vine and not abiding in the vine. When we quit abiding in the vine, he'll prune us or maybe separate us from the congregation or something along that line. Get down to verse number 7. He uses a word, he's used it a couple of times already, several times. He says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. The last time we talked about his words, we were talking about keeping his words. Talking about knowing what the words are and doing what they say, yes? That's keeping the words. Here it's talking about abiding there. What's the difference? There's, there's an attitude difference. There's a, there's a presence of God difference. Abiding in the words. He says, if ye abide in me. If ye abide in me. It's no longer keeping the commandments, though that's coming again. We're going to see those words again. It's not, just, it's not just doing things. He's talking about, are the words important enough? Is the Word of God important enough? Is God important enough to abide there? Hey, let me ask you this. What, what input has given you the most time today? By that I mean, uh, is it maybe internet? Or television, uh, some TV show, a movie. What about the Word of God? What has been put in the most? Hey, listen, you want to learn what it means to abide in Christ. Brother, brother said it the other night, he used the word meditate. He said, meditate on something. Hey, listen, spend time in the Scripture. Meditate there. Hover around. Toss it around in your mind. Understand what the phrases in the verse are saying. Meditate on it. Meditate there. Hey, listen, you wonder why the Word of God does not influence your day. Are you abiding in it? You want to abide in it? Have more input from the Word of God than you have from something else. Are you following that? Hey, it's not, it should not be unusual to have two hours in a day in the Word of God. Amen. Is that unusual? It shouldn't be strange to us to give time, real time, to the Word of God. I can remember at the roofing company, I was putting in 14 hours a day. I had an hour for lunch. I'd sit in the dump truck and read the Bible. And I'd get up in the morning. And 
when I go in waiting for the shop open and I read the Bible, I remember the only way I could get the time in the Word of God was simply to make time. I did that when I was driving tractor trailers over the road. I can remember drive so hard and so long and, and, and working hard at it. Get where you're going and you just have to do things to keep yourself awake and spend time in the Word of God. Oh, that the radio not have more input in me than the Word of God. Oh, that the television set not have as much time as the Bible. The Bible. We say we believe it. This blessed old book, the King James Bible, do you believe it's the Word of God? Do you believe Amen. it? Amen. Hey, listen. Would you spend some time in it? Listen. It will take a whole new look to you. If you start giving enough time that it's abiding in you and you're abiding in it, it becomes you and God. It's not really just words. It's not like reading a book. Hey, you're walking with God when you do that. You want to see your prayer life transformed? Yeah, let me just tell you, if you want to transform your prayer life, just make your commitment to the Word of God. You cannot help but pray when you spend time in the Bible. It will come. Say, so how do I get my prayer life going on? Hey, listen, you spend, you get a couple hours here and you start meditating, and before long, those Bible promises, before long, you see, you see what would help your friend. Then you start praying a spirit filled prayer. Hey, listen, a faith prayer. You ever see your prayers answered? We believe God will answer prayers. Yes? Are you seeing them get answered? Hey, listen, I promise you, you spend time here. Spend time here. Let God move you. So I just can't get myself started praying. You won't spend much time with God without getting started praying because you cannot help. Hey, it'll start with praises and thanksgiving because you'll start seeing some of the precious promises and they'll become so much more real to you than just what you heard the preacher say. It'll be real. It gets real. It becomes something you can't live without. It becomes something you long for. Have you longed for your Bible today? Have you wanted it? Have you just looked forward to the next moment you could get to it? Oh, when you get a little free time at lunch. Get a little free time. You, you know that, that on your way home, there's a traffic jam anyway. Why not just pull over and pull out the Bible? Man, read the thing. Read it. It's better than this. I know audio is wonderful. I'd love to make CDs and I hope we get to do that and pass them out so people can. But listen to me. Nothing replaces opening up the book. Spending time in the book. Get in the thing. Let God move you. How does He do that? It's called a body. A body. You, you want to ever. We talk about walking in the Spirit. Also, say amen. But you pin somebody down and ask them what it looks like. Most people can't tell. If you're not doing something, you just don't know what it looks like. I promise you this. It starts with the Word of God. Confess sin. I wasn't going to go here, but here we are. Confess sin. Let me ask you. When's the last time you confessed every sin that you know belongs to you? I don't mean some blanket sin, God forgive me for this sort of thing. I mean naming them one by one. The preacher, you have that many sins. Listen, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I started um, some time back. I, I confess sin three or four times a day. I said, preacher, who does it on the preacher? <laughs> Hey, listen, you ought to try that. I mean it. You ought to try it. It will remove distractions if you're walking around clean. If you're walking around clean. Confess sin. Confess it all. And when you run out and you're done, then, then go back to your knees and cry out to the Holy Spirit to make you see the ones that you missed. I guarantee you, you didn't get them all. We're too proud to acknowledge all of our sins. Ask God to show them to you. Oh God, what sin 
is in my heart that stands between me and you. I'm not sure what he's talking about abiding. I don't know what he means. Reading the Bible just moves me to pray. I need to get this sin out. Show me my sin. Do without a night's sleep. Hey, listen, if you haven't, I'm being very serious with you. If you haven't done this in the last two or three years, it'll probably cost you a night's sleep. You, hey, you got more than you think. We have sin. Yet the sin confess. I urge you, as you're going through the Bible, and you see those precious promises. And they become start becoming real because all of a sudden you're spending a couple of hours reading the thing. You're meditating. It gets real. You can, you can, it's okay to pause and praise God for the many blessings that He's bestowed. And you see the problem. There are promises in there. There are blessings in your life you don't even know about. And they're all in the Word of God. Praises and thanksgiving. I pray for everybody in this church. I'm going to just tell you. I, I, I look at the list many times and I pray over it. But I'm going to tell you my usual way. When I get to you, I ask God, how should I pray for this person? And he reminds me of some promise that, that you need. I, if, if I thought I could, I would just tell you. Everybody sitting here, I can tell you how God has led me to pray for you in the last week or so. He gives it to me through the scriptures. I don't even know what's going on in most of your lives in a private way. I have no idea. But I know what God has led me to for the word of God to pray for you. I'm telling you, abide in Him and He in you. Walk with God. Walk with Him. Hey, don't let, don't let Satan have an inch. I'm not saying don't ever cast your eyes on the television and say, I'm not saying that because I do that sometimes. Maybe I shouldn't. But what I'm telling you is, it shouldn't have no competition with the amount of time that is spent in this book. It shouldn't be close to how much time this book is. There's only one way this book can mold us into what we want it to want to be, and that's following Christ. That's, that's being an, an agent of His. That's being a member of righteousness and not unrighteousness. The only way that can happen is if we give our time to the precious Word of God. It will change who you are in a good way. Well, it says, if a man abide not in me, I'm in the wrong verse. That will preach too. It says, uh, here in verse 8, is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. By the way, it's, a, it's an abiding that we bear much fruit. Well, I'm doing pretty good preaching. You know, if you're not abiding in Christ, Listen, that's where the fruit is. That's where the fruit is. It says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And this is how he does it. Hey, listen, in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. What does he mean? Hey, listen. You want to experience... We're talking about sending our love language, communicating to God that we love Him. You want to experience God's love language to you? You want to know what that feels like? Hey, listen. It's not just being saved. There's more to Christian life than being saved. Ever since the presence of God, you don't do that if you never abide in Christ. Christ in you. Listen, God loves you. And He wants to do a mighty work I'm not talking about any preacher. He wants to do it in you. He wants to do it in you. Age is no, no consequence. You can be 20, 40, 60, or 80, and God still has a mighty work to do with you. Through a patience of hope, a labor of love that produces a work of faith. God wants to do a mighty work. I want to ask the musicians to come.